Good morning. Good morning. Video. I'm just about set up here. It takes me a while to figure it all out every time because I'm slow, because I'm old. And when you're old and slow, it's really no fun to have you guys. I mean, it's no really fun to have me as a teacher. That is a sh damn shame. Sorry about that. Okay. Anywho, it's a couple minutes before nine and people are arriving and that's all good. Uh, when everybody gets here or a little bit after nine, I'm going to announce that, of course, again, I messed up with the um, due date somehow for um, uh five squares, five more squares. And so I've reopened the due date for anybody who wasn't able to get it in this weekend because I want to make sure I get those things. And I love taking in later stuff and without um, uh, any kind of a penalty or anything like that. I just want to get it in. And I'm not used to dealing with this software yet. I'm learning it, but like I said, I'm slow really slow on the uptake and so trying to figure out how to set due dates in the homework so that you guys can get it in and be consistent and not have all of us setting all of our uh, homework uh, being due for Sunday at midnight so that um, we're not overwhelming the system with everybody trying to turn in all of their homework all at the same time and crash the system on Sunday night at midnight is kind of funky. So I suppose <coughs> I chose another night, like Saturday night or something. And then I messed up half the people who were looking forward to send it, to turning it in on Sunday. So uh, I'll try to figure this out with the next assignment here as we go into the next assignment. <coughs> so I'm gonna open up my participants list to see who's all here. This is a beautiful thing. We'll be taking attendance pretty soon. And so I've got my participants list and I'm opening my chat window so that people who wanna write me nasty grams about anything, but especially your frustration with not being able to get your thing turned in this weekend, can send me a private message or make a comment in the chat but now that we're passing nine o'clock in the morning here on the West Coast, I just want to let people know that um, I did not mean to shut half of you out when you tried to turn in your assignment on Sunday. I must have inadvertently set the due date for Saturday. And so I've reopened the uh, assignment for everybody who hasn't got it turned in yet. Please go ahead and turn in um, your assignment. Um, five more squares um, and then I'll be able to see it in the coursework and be able to grade it in the coursework. Uh, I appreciate those of you who tried to send it to me via email over the weekend. Um, it, that doesn't really do me much good except that it shows me that you're making an honest attempt to get it turned in, which I do appreciate. Um, and it does let me know that I have messed up someplace like putting the wrong due date on or putting a due date on, but then forgetting that I set it for Saturday and telling everybody that it was open till Sunday. And so that's why we had this problem. So my apologies. Uh, I've opened it again for another couple of days until like Tuesday night or something or Wednesday night. So please go ahead and just uh, at your convenience, um, go ahead and uh, resubmit your homework if you haven't been able to submit five more squares. The uh, assignment is now reopened for. Uh, being able to submit that. And I will get to that grading uh, very soon, very shortly. I appreciate you guys getting it turned in. And I thought it was gonna get, I thought the due date was Sunday night at midnight. So that's why I haven't looked at any of the one, those that got turned in earlier. Sorry about that. So we will, I will get this figured out one of these days. Um, we are supposed to be gentle with each other and make sure that we're, um, being nice to each other and uh, trying to get all of this figured out so that you guys can um, ease into this quarter and not get messed up by the technology or anything else. And that kind of includes me trying to not get messed up by the technology either. 
And so I'm just okay. Uh, checking my phone messages for something else and trying to run things. Okay. So at three or four minutes past the hour, we're going to get this party started here. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm going to go through the participants list here and make sure those of you who are here are getting participation points for attending today. Thank you very much. I see Autumn and Caprina is here. Where's that Matthias girl? And Kelsey's here. Welcome. If I can find you on my list, that would even be, there we go. Amazing. Kiara is here. Riley is there. Sarah, as always, is here with bells on. Skylar Moore is here. Fantastic. Ethan, I see you coming in the door. That's good too. All right. So, so far, so good. Okay. Aiden is with me for the Zoom. Fan damn tastic. All right. Good job. I'm glad that you guys are figuring out a way to get in here. Um, that's good. So thank you for that. Ah, okay. So Skylar, Sarah, Autumn, Caprina, Ethan, and that's eight participants so far. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yay. Okay. So a few more people will be um, uh, stumbling through the door drunk. I hope not, but we'll see how it goes on. Uh, anyway, thanks for coming. Welcome. Art 115, this is the beginning of the fourth week of the quarter. We're finally starting to get the hang of all of this stuff, or at least may I say that I am trying to you know, finally get the hang of all of this stuff. I'm gonna do a PowerPoint presentation today on chapter three, um, talking about line as an element of art. And as a way to introduce you to the chapter that we're gonna be reading, like, I hope that everybody has gotten, gotten the book by now and that you can get all caught up on the reading chapters one, two, and now three this week. Um, in chapter three, I'd like you to pay, pay particular attention to the definitions at the beginning of the chapter. Um, your authors do a really lovely job at giving us this box full of uh, vocabulary words with their definitions. And that's pretty much going to be the core of the quiz that we're going to take at midterm. There is going to be a little quiz at midterm and at final exam time. Um, it helps me make this um, into more of a uh, an academic class when we are uh, reviewing the terms and, and quizzing on them. Um, I'm somewhat uncomfortable um, trying to make a uh, studio art class into an academic class with those kinds of, of checks on them. Um, and so I walk that line of trying to not have too much reading and too much um, uh, <clears throat> writing of essays and all of that kind of stuff in a course that's supposed to be hands-on uh, about the elements of art and um, the principles of design. And so, but I do like to have at least a midterm quizzy quiz quiz and a final quiz to do that with. And so I hear people arriving in my thing. Ethan Zeke is here, fantastic. All right, and that's good. All right, so huh, let's do this thing. I am going to do my share screen thing and get into chapter three, uh, talking about line today. Now, once again, I'm gonna do the share screen and find my silly PowerPoint presentation and get it up on the screen and then open this thing up as a slideshow. Yay. And now I've got so many damn windows open on my thing, I'm gonna to have to close up a couple of them or minimize them so that I can see what I'm doing here. So I'm asking you guys to read chapter three this week. Familiarize yourself with chapter three. Um, it, it, tries to describe all of the different th kinds of things that line can do for you in a composition. And we're going to go over some of that stuff today. Um, look at those vocabulary words in the big box at the beginning of the chapter. Um, have a really good working knowledge of that stuff. My quiz, which will happen at midterm, which will be next week sometime, 
because uh, next week is the fifth week of the quarter. Fifth week of a 10-week quarter is the midterm of the quarter, and so that's a great time to do a little quiz. So it'll be on the first three chapters, and it'll just be kind of a general understanding of the concepts covered in the first three chapters. And it will all be multiple choice. So you will have multiple choice options for your answers, and it should not be a very difficult uh, quiz. So I just, I wanted those of you with testing anxiety, those of you who are concerned about that because you're non-majors and you don't want to, you know, worry too much about getting a deep dive into art and design, um, I do want you still to have a uh, familiarity with the, with the terms that we are using in this chapter. Okay, so let's see here. Why isn't that? There we go. Okay, so I am moving through this PowerPoint on chapter three. Chapter three introduces us to the concept of line as one of the five elements of art. Uh, remember the five elements of art are line, shape, value, texture, color, that these are the only things that you can really make visual elements, visual ideas out of. And so these are the basic building blocks of art. And so one of the most basic building blocks is the line. And it's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, so you're, we're defining line as the path of a moving point made by a tool instrument or medium as it moves across an area. So it can be just the path made by a point, like um, a shooting star, um, the point of a pencil or a pen as it's moving across the page. However, <clears throat> that does trace a line behind it. And so um, it is the path uh, or the line uh, traced behind a moving point. It becomes visible because it contrasts with its surroundings. And so um, that's how you know we start to become aware of the idea of a line when it is in contrast with the negative space in the composition. Um, in contrast with its surroundings. And there are such things as three-dimensional lines. So this uh, applies to sculpture, architecture, um, even nature you know, has three-dimensional lines. I'm looking outside my window right now at trees on the, on the um, horizon. And so there's lots of lines all over the place, lines and linear forms if we just look for them. And so three-dimensional lines can be made using string or wire, tubes, industrial steel, just about anything that becomes a linear element. And um, as we get into our first project uh, dealing with line, I'm going to define a linear object as something that is like five times longer than it is wide. So a linear object becomes, a, I should say, a rectangle for our purposes can become a linear element when it's, and I'm making something super arbitrary here, five times longer than it is wide. That way a, a rectangle becomes long enough that it starts to feel more like a linear element than just a rectangular shape. That's a distinction almost without a difference, but we will talk about that on our first project. So we'll keep that in mind. These lines, are much longer than they are wide. <laughs> They're way more than five times their uh, width in length. And so on one of our um, earlier editions of the book, this was the cover art for the book. And in some later editions, this is used in chapter three about line to describe what can happen when you're just doing something that is very abstract, very minimal in a composition that's just dealing with line and linear elements. So it's a painting by Pat Steer. It's Inner Sanctum Waterfall from 1992. Um, it's very interesting for me because there are two different kinds of lines being expressed here. One is this huge cascade of vertical lines running across the entire width of this horizontal composition. So I see all of these vertical lines and they are not just lines, they also make a vertical linear texture dancing across this whole page. Then in the lower half or the lower third of this composition, there are some lines that are going horizontally in kind of curved, broken, bouncy um, method across the lower 
what I would call register or the lower half of the composition, they almost look like the, the splash of rain um, kind of falling down and hitting something and then splashing sideways. And so that's where we're kind of getting this sense of movement, this sense of directionality, and the sense of impact or um, uh, rebounding that's happening with the lines that are descending uh, from the top of the page to the bottom of the page. And so that's, a, that's one of the ideas about line is that your eye will follow the path of the line, following the path traced by the line, which then starts to open up the idea of directionality, of movement in the composition as you follow the idea of line. Um, we are probably most used to seeing line being used to construct shapes and to construct images. And so, you know, in any drawing or in any um, etching or printmaking uh, that's done mostly by using line in a composition, um, we get really used to seeing the idea of a picture, uh, a set of images a composition being constructed out of lines and linear forms. And so we can look at something like this, Harriet Blake's The Stowe House from 1890, and see that all of these things are basically built up from lines and linear elements. The shape of the house, the texture of the uh, clapboard siding on the house, all of the different kinds of trees that are being depicted here, everything in this composition is made up of basically line segments and line elements. So we're starting to see how, um, how very diverse line can be and what it, it can be used for, because it can either be used to describe the outside contour of a shape, it can be used to describe textures, um, it can, when it's put together with other lines, it can become quite a complex way of expressing um, visual ideas. On the other hand, it, it, when used in a very um, economical use of line, and remember economy, the economical use of an element is one of the ways that we um, uh, um, organize, uh, organize space in a composition. One of the organizational principles is the economical use of an element. And so this is the economical use of line. We're only using the outside contours of the shapes and they're being described as a line. And what's so beautiful about this drawing by Ellsworth Kelly is that the briar uh, is made up of two concepts. It's uh, both a vine that has a very prickly pointy um, um, thing on it. Uh, uh, a really nasty uh, element that you don't want to get stuck on on your uh, arm or something like that, um, that can puncture you, that can harm you and hurt you. But also the leaves are very soft. So we've got this large, round, soft use of line to describe the outside contour of the leaves. And then the, the, the character of the line changes um, to describe the pointy barbs of the briar itself. And so it's the same um, pencil or pen that is used to draw the lines, but the, the quality of the line and the content of the line completely changes from a round, um, soft, smooth, maybe even slow flowing form to rather quick, abrupt, sharp, um, sharp change of direction uh, that's happening uh, in the in the um, uh, the stickies the sticklers of the briar itself. Um, Henri de Toulouse Lautrec is a painter, a post impressionist painter from France uh, from the uh, late nineteenth century, and uh, he liked to hang out in dance halls for the most part and brothels and paint. Um, the people who would hang out in the seedier side of town, people who would hang out in bars, the dancers who would dance and perform at the dance halls and that kind of thing. Um, and he was really famous for making uh, posters to advertise the dance hall girls and the dancing that would happen at um, uh, the different cafes and uh, clubs. Um, 
one of the, his favorite people to paint or draw was Jane Avril, one of the dancers. Um, and so this is from 1893. And it's, it's done in pen and ink. Um, and with a uh, calligraphic pen, you can get all kinds of very calligraphic um, line in, the, in a composition. And calligraphy, if you haven't done it before, is the art of beautiful drawing. And so we see um, lines that express themselves in a wide variety of different ways in this very simple, once again, economical composition. Using a calligraphic pen, if I can get my cursor to work, we have a line that starts off thin and then gets thicker along the length of it and then gets thin again and then thicker again. And so the changing of the width of the line along its length makes the line an inver a very dr dynamic um, linear form as it's moving around the composition. We have very tiny, thin lines, but also very flowing, moving, um, dynamic lines in the composition. And so with just a very few deft strokes of his pen, he's able to cr create the idea of this dancer um, dancing, you know, on the floorboards of the stage um, inside the dance hall, even with this sense of the gas lights, um, light fixture hanging overhead. So um, very, very quick, sketchy um, indication of the lighting, the floorboards below her, the quick movement of tiny little feet happening here. It's interesting that the, the hem of her skirt comes around here, breaks for a second, and then comes down and, and continues flowing on into the ankle and foot of her left foot over here. And so we get a lot of movement that happens, a lot of sense of flowing movement um, in a still composition, and a lot being uh, expressed in a very economical use of very few elements in the composition. Okay. Um, I am just going to uh, stop my screen share for just a second. I wanted to look at my participants list and see if you guys are still here for the most part and see if anybody is trying to reach me in the chat for anything because I keep hearing lots and lots of traffic on my screen. Hearing none, I'm coming back right into my chapter three again. Oh my God. Okay, we're going to do this um, and I'll get you there. I have to get rid of just a couple more things that are on my screen. Okay. <clears throat> when artists sign their names, when artists sign their signatures on a work of art, they're using line. So, you know, we can even think of our alphabet, the way that we write um, uh, in, in words and vocabulary in language um, as, <coughs> excuse me, an extension of the use of line and linear elements in a composition. And it's not just, um, it's not, whoops, it's not just uh, writing in English or Western um, alphabets, um, even the use of uh, calligraphy, pen and ink in um, Eastern traditions uh, of, of written language is still uh, the use of line uh, in terms of visual communication. It's a beautiful thing, even if we don't understand it, if we, even if we cannot read the characters in another language um, or in another uh, written tradition, uh, we can still uh, be fascinated by and even entertained by the beauty of the line um, expressed that way. Okay, so when line is used in an expressive way, it can communicate all different kinds of energy uh, to us. Um, we can see a very energetic use of line in this painting. Um, we can, you know, tell that it's a very energetic line because most of the lines in here are, are done on a diagonal. And we're going to discover that line can have a lot of different kinds of qualities to it. Um, a horizontal line is much more quiet and subdued in terms of its energy level. A vertical line has more energy uh, because it is, is running vertical and we live kind of in a vertical format in our own lives. And so when we are up and about, when we're walking around or running around, we are much more active when we are vertical. And so we as, a, attribute the idea of energy to a vertical line. And then when we see a, a diagonal line like this or a zigzag line, um, that has the most energy possible 
we associate that with, with lots of energy, like a lightning strike in a night sky. The idea of the diagonal line um, usually means high velocity, lots of energy associated with it. And so that's what we associate even when we see diagonal lines in a compositional space. When they change direction, when there's lots of different diagonal lines and zigzag lines moving in and out um, that dazzles the eye, even the Zs in the word dazzle give us a little bit of that uh, diagonal linear energy uh, in the composition. And so we, we associate all of this with hectic frenetic movement in a composition. <coughs> Let's contrast that with a painting that deals a lot more with slow, um, curving, loopy lines. Um, this composition, Continuous Ship Curves from 1991, um, relates more to the idea of plotting uh, perhaps um, the uh, routes of ships on charts and maps uh, as they cross the oceans and that kind of thing. And the, the much slower sense of movement uh, with the occasional uh, button hook on these things um, gives us a whole different energy level in this kind of composition. In fact, the only really strong um, uh, energetic line in the whole composition is the red diagonal line that comes cr cutting across all of these other thin, slow moving, happy, um, little loopy, loopy lines and curvy lines that make up this composition. So we can see that line can have a, a completely different effect on us. Um, it can carry a lot of different kinds of information. It can carry a different amount of energy, just depending on how it is used and what shape, for lack of a better word, it has in a composition. Now, here are curving lines and diagonal lines kind of combined into a composition. And again, it's kind of fun to do this with abstraction so that then we can just break it down and look at what's basically happening with lines and linear forms in a composition. We have um, this painting uh, is, is broken up into a whole bunch of rectangular shapes that are described by a um, contour line going around a rectangular space. So we have line defining the shapes of the rectangles. And then most of the, the rectangles are filled with a diagonal line. A repeated, mostly parallel diagonal line fills most of the rectangular shapes. Some rectangles are filled with a squiggle, some kind of a squiggly line that kind of has a much more energetic feel to it because the squiggle happens to be tightly packed and moving around and it feels like it's almost vibrating in terms of the amount of movement in the squiggles. Now, um, that's happening throughout most of the composition. And so that is, those are factors of harmony because we've got lots of rectangles harmonizing the entire composition, um, a great deal of rectangles that have diagonal lines in them and some rectangles that are dispersed throughout the composition that have squiggles in them. For the areas of interest in the composition, the areas that are uh, examples of variety in the composition, we've got two things going. We've got some very bold diagonal lines that are kind of going around one of the rectangles in the lower left-hand corner that uh, attract our eye and become a focal point in the composition. And they replicate or they kind of um, echo what's happening with the thin diagonal lines that are making up most of the interior spaces of most of the, of the rectangles in the composition. The other thing we've got going on here are the fat squiggly lines that are done in color that are kind of smashed together over here, sharing an edge in a compositional space so that they are very much a kind of a super shape uh, made up of three different distinct areas of big, fat, wormy, squiggly lines. They actually relate very closely to the tightly packed squiggly lines in the other areas of the composition, and yet they elaborate on that a little bit. They become larger. 
they become revealed to us in a slightly different color that's not being used anywhere else in the composition. And so we have you know, these three blobs of squiggly lines and this little L-shaped figure of very bold diagonal lines are creating two focal point areas of variety or visual interest in the composition in the context of all of the rest of it, which provides more harmony in the composition. This is one of those examples, these crazy examples of, you know, if you just spend a little time with a, a non-objective, non-representational, um, abstract work of art, you can kind of deduce, you can figure out what's going on just by analyzing what's, ha what's happening in the composition. Where are the areas of harmony in the composition? And how does that make the composition hold together? And then where are the areas of variety in the composition? And how does that attract our eye and make something that's a little bit more interesting that, make, that uh, attracts the eye and make us linger longer over this particular shape or this particular area of the composition? And so line is one way that we're gonna see both harmony and variety in a composition. Um, again, Rembrandt, uh, one of the great painters of the 17th century uh, in the Netherlands, uh, doing quick studies in a sketchbook for paintings that are going to become uh, much more you know, large and elaborate works of art as a painting. Most painters work with drawings in sketchbook form to do initial um, uh, thumbnail sketches or work out some of the compositional ideas before they commit to a large scale um, painting. And so we just want to be aware of the idea that line is a very important thing um, used by even painters uh, as they uh, <laughs> sketch out or try to design um, a painting that they're going to execute. We call these preliminary drawings, preliminary sketches, and uh, often they're found in, in uh, sketchbooks. And it's really fun for art historians and art lovers to see the early ideas of a painting that then becomes a much more um, large and elaborate um, painting when it's realized in paint on canvas. So I've been talking for about 15 or 20 minutes about line and just what line can do for you in a composition, how line can express itself. We also want to talk about the spatial characteristics of line, how line can define space in a composition, either two-dimensional or three-dimensional illusion of depth of space in a composition. And so that becomes another interesting aspect of line um, that can um, add to the, the viewer's um, enjoyment of the artwork or the design, and it can help the designer or artist um, uh, create uh, more engagement with the viewer uh, and, and more effects uh, in, the, in the design or the artwork. So let's look at something like something as crude as a wood, a wood block print. Um, usually uh, printmakers will take a, a chunk of wood and a gouge or a, um, uh, a chisel and just chisel away on the surface of something like a piece of plywood or something, leaving uh, wood up at the top surface, the original surface of the piece of plywood, let's say, that they will then ink up with a roller with ink on it and put paper over the top of to pull a print off of that wood block, um, printing block. And so this is one, Emil Noldi um, uh, is a German artist uh, from the early part of the 20th century. We have this fishing boat um, that's out on the sea. And you know, at first, at, first at first blush, at first glance, this is just a simple you know, fishing boat on the ocean. What's really interesting about the way that line is being used um, in terms of space and spatial relationships is that we have rather large, coarse um, chunks of line being used in the foreground, the, the area of the composition that's nearest to us, nearest to the viewer's eye, to give us more of a sense of the rolling sense of the sea uh, and the ocean. 
And as we move from the foreground into the middle ground and background, we can see that the spacing between the lines becomes thinner and that the actual lines themselves become much closer together and thinner. And so the spatial relationships can show us that um, this part of the composition is closer to us because these elements are larger and uh, have a little bit more detail and are a little bit more elaborated upon. Whereas the stuff that moves back into the background and towards the horizon becomes a lot um, less clear. It's, they're much smaller details, they're much closer together, and they kind of morph right into the side of the fishing boat itself uh, in terms of horizontal um, linear cuts in the um, woodcut composition. And then he even pulls that, uh, that same linear uh, form idea up into the upper register of the composition. The smoke coming out of the smokestack from the engine compartment of the ship are linear forms that are rolling, and they really relate to the rolling linear forms of the ocean in the foreground. And some of the elements of the sky, the um, clouds in the far distant background up in the sky are also thin and relating somewhat to some of the thinner areas uh, of um, sea that are happening in the middle ground and background as we move towards the horizon and up by the boat. And so when we're using line like this, it's a, it's a wonderful way to unify the composition. All of this use of horizontal line, whether it's rolling, curving horizontal line in the, in the uh, lower half of the composition or much more uh, horizontal line with a few uh, senses of rolling line in the upper part of the composition, all of that tends to unify the composition very much. What tends to create a little bit of variety for us that attracts our eye is the outline shape of the boat with these vertical elements, the um, actual vertical masts on the fishing boat are a little bit different. They're the only vertical lines in the composition except for perhaps this um, buoy that is floating in the water here. And so those things are things that uh, provide a little bit of variety for us. It gives us something interesting to look at. Points of interest that attract the eye in the composition while all of the horizontal movement in the composition tends to unify it together. Now, there is uni there's unity in a composition and then there's variety. And sometimes you can just do it um, with changes in size and changes in color. Um, we've got this painting from 1988 and all it is is curving squiggly lines. But this curving squiggly lines have a, a huge variety of different characteristics or attributes to them. Um, they all have a, a similar uh, curve to the squiggle of each line, but some are thick and some are very thin. Some are red and orange, and some are brown, and some are blue, and some are black. And so we have, you know, the, the concept of squiggly line is distributed throughout the painting. And so that is our factor of harmony that helps to hold this bunch of exploding worms all together in a composition. And yet having little red ones in here, or fat red orange ones, and even a fatter, you know, brown one in, across the top give us areas of variety in the composition where our eye can come to rest. And uh, um, that's the, those places of elaboration in the composition um, that, that provides some variety, some points of interest, something for us to look at so our eye just isn't looking at an entire plate of spaghetti. Because Spaghetti all by itself is not a very interesting art form or design, but if you pick out you know, a couple of pieces of spaghetti and dye them orange or brown and then stick them back in and kind of mix them in a little bit in the plate of spaghetti, then you start to get interest and variety in the composition. And then it, it becomes something that is more artistic. It has some design principles going on and it's, it's much more fun to look at. Um, Here's something that is, you know, urban jewels. It's supposed to be a cityscape at night seen from above as if you're in a very tall building or an airplane flying over a city. And so we get the sense of 
the three-dimensional aspect of buildings, the front, side, and roof of a building, um, indicated mostly just by crisscrossing lines, uh, cross-hatched lines in a composition. Um, it's the, the, the repetition of all of those kinds of sense of cross hatchings, giving us a sense of three-dimensional buildings um, with light and shadow. Uh, the idea of um, perhaps <clears throat> light coming out of windows of buildings or illuminated by street lights down below on the streets. And all of that is just abstracted into just the concept of these three-dimensional figures created mostly by just cross-hatched lines in a composition. Now, this is something I want us to pay particular attention to. This is a concept of cross-contour lines used in a composition. Cross-contour lines are really interesting because sometimes um, artists will use lines that go across the contour of something that describe the actual contour of a three-dimensional form. And the artist is then not using much of anything to, in terms of shading or any kind of visual um, information to really tell us what's going on in the composition other than just the lines crossing across the contour of something. Um, we've got, you know, this person uh, is sitting cross-legged on a couch. Um, the couch is covered in some kind of a fabric. The person is wearing a, uh, uh, a long um, glove, uh, like a, an opera glove that goes all the way up to the elbow. And so all of these different kinds of things, the skirt, the glove, the socks or whatever, um, the striped uh, covering on the couch are all being described only in terms of um, cross contour lines. And so the cross contour lines, when they go across fabric, uh, fabric that has drapery folds in it gives a sense of movement as the cross contour lines follow the contours of the drapery folds. They give us a sense of movement and contours as they go across the contours of the fingers, the back of the hand, the back of the wrist and arm, um, and similarly uh, the other drapery folds too. There's going to be a point next week when we're going to do a drawing like this at home. I'm going to ask you guys to set up a still life. I'm going to set up a still life here in my studio, and I'm going to do a demonstration where we construct an actual drawing like this. And since you're not in the studio with me, you're going to have to set up your own still life at home and then draw that still life. The ultimate goal of this is to erase all of the contour lines and anything else that we used to construct all of these shapes and only populate the drawing with cross contour lines that go across the contours of each shape in the composition to describe the shape or directionality of that shape. Don't panic, especially if you've never drawn a picture before, please don't panic. I'm going to walk you through this step by step, and we're going to learn uh, how to draw, and we're going to kind of play with the idea of a cross-contour line drawing next week. So I want you to just remember this and uh, make a note of it for now, because we'll, we'll be coming back to this concept uh, in a while. Okay. Artists can use lines um, either in an economical use of line or, um, you know, in a more elaborate way to create portraits of people. Um, portraiture is a big part of art and using line to use to make drawings and uh, portraiture that's done as line drawings is there's a rich tradition in that. I get a kick out of this one because this one um, is a lot like the Mona Lisa, um, Michelangelo's Mona Lisa we have. A portrait of a person, a three-quarter portrait where they're uh, being seen a little bit um, in a kind of a three-quarter view of their face. Their face isn't directly facing us in full face, and it's not a, a um, silhouette or um, a sideways portrait uh, that we're not just looking at the silhouette of their face. We're seeing um, a three-quarter view of the face. But what's interesting for me for this is when you have the hands clasped like this, and we can see this, um, this uh, rhythmic um, repetition of form in these wonderful little round um, sausage-like fingers over here, we can then go over to the elbow 
where the uh, uh, the sleeve of the jacket is kind of bending and drapery forms are or drapery folds are forming in the crux of the elbow and we can see a very similar kind of movement happening in this area over here so that the drapery folds at this elbow make us um, very much reminiscent of and echo the idea of the uh, the folded fingers um, that are happening in this part of the composition so that when we come back up to the face we are, our eyes then are really much more focused on what's happening with the lines across the forehead because they feel a lot like the fingers down here and the drapery folds over here. And then we get this, this repetition of form happening in three different distinct areas of the composition that really help to unify the composition, create factors of harmony that harmonize the composition, but also um, kind of engage us because it's three distinct areas. We've got fingers over here, drapery folds over here, and lines on the face up here. And they, they have a, a sense of difference in the different areas where they're applied and a kind of a sense of sameness or uniformity because they're doing a really similar thing in the three different corners of the composition, which is really kind of fun. Um, Getting towards the end of the chapter, your authors are also going to talk about gesture line drawing. Uh, the idea that you can use line to not only describe the outside contours of a shape, and we can, we can look at the drum over here on the ground or the outside edges of the chair as being constructed out of contour lines. But when we look at the energetic use of line that's happening in and out and through this figure here, this is something that we play with in drawing class an awful lot as a gestural line. And gesture line describes the energy that's happening in a composition, not necessarily the quality or shape of the outside of the contours of something. So the contours of this person standing up on this chair really aren't all that important. We get a sense of an overall um, standing figure um, gesturing uh, wildly in the air while singing, and we get a sense of the energy and movement of this, mostly because of these dancing, wonderful, unbridled gesture lines that are happening throughout the composition. And the gesture lines are as important, or even I would say even a little bit more important than actually trying to describe the actual outside tech uh, contour of the person standing on the chair. The most important thing in this composition is the energy that we feel from the gesture lines that are kind of coursing around, inter interspersed and throughout um, the upper torso of this person. And so gesture is just another way of expressing energy in a composition and another way that line can express energy in a composition. Here's a, a kind of a use of gesture line or energetic line in a composition in a painting where we've got this string trio madly sawing on their fiddles and cello here, trying to give us a sense of movement and energy in a fairly uh, fast moving piece of music. And because we've got this uh, repetition of lots of diagonal lines and strokes of lines, and particles of line, and we can see not very well defined edges to things, we get a sense of these guys moving fast and trying to interpret music that is punchy and energetic and quickly moving. So quickly moving that the even the music stand is kind of rocking back and forth and moving because the music is moving so fast. So an artist can play with the idea of line and not just give you an illustration, a photographic sense of what's happening in the composition, but in a still sense of a painting, give us a sense of the movement, the energy, the action that's happening in a composition in the use of gestural lines. And in this case, these lines, these gestural lines become a little bit more like construction lines or contour lines, but they are unfocused. They don't really nail down the outside contours of shapes. And so we get all of this suggestion and ghostly suggestion of movement happening for every shape in the composition. And we're left with the idea of just energy and movement as the main focus of, of this particular composition. 
Um, lines can happen in three dimensions like your authors talk about and so at the end of the chapters um, dealing with three-dimensional ideas of line we also get a sense of what can happen in sculpture or three-dimensional design or architecture when architects and sculptors play with the idea of a line moving in space we get a very slow moving sense of fluid motion with this kind of line here um, and so we get a sense of that kind of movement uh, also that's going to end this for me for today. I'm going to hit my stop share button. I'm going to come back to you guys and try to see if there's anybody who's still here who survived that horrible experience. It looks like there's people still here. And wake up if you fell asleep because the, uh, the presentation is over. But that is in a nutshell what chapter three is about. I would like you, of course, to read chapter three so that you can get it from your, for yourself and you can interpret the text as I have done uh, reading the text uh, about how your authors describe the different qualities of line in a composition. And on Wednesday, I'm gonna demonstrate and we're gonna start off ourselves on another project. It's going to be another um, collage where we're going to be finding linear elements in the art the fashion magazine again and we're going to construct a composition out of linear elements and try to make lines dance across a composition and play with the idea of, li of lines and linear elements that we create ourselves um, finding them or constructing them out of areas of uh, advertising and imagery in the um, fashion magazine and then gluing them down into a compositional space. This isn't five squares anymore. You are done with squares from now on. And so now we're going to be playing with lines and linear elements. It's going to be more interesting and more individualized as you guys uh, create your own linear elements and then put them together in your own sense, your own interpretation of a um, uh, <clears throat> a compositional space dominated by lines and linear elements. So that's what's on tap for Wednesday. Are there any questions for the good of the order? Have I got you guys so um, hornswoggled and lost that you don't know what's going on? Or are you guys just totally so enthralled with the, uh, this concept of line and linear form this, this week that um, you're jazzed? You're ready to do this. You can't wait to play with lines. We're gonna play with lines for about two weeks and at least two projects. And so um, uh, this is gonna be our first one. This is gonna be an introduction to line. And then we're gonna jump into a line drawing, which uh, I think you're gonna find very interesting. Um, I don't see any burning questions uh, because microphones are not becoming unmuted to me. I don't see any hands up. Usually if you have a question, you can also put up your little blue hand and click on that and then I can see that you have a question for me. The group chat is strangely quiet with not a lot of stuff going on in the group chat today. And so I'm gonna call it a day. This was my presentation on chapter one. I'd like you to read chapter one. And on Wednesday, we're gonna start our next project. If you did not get a chance to upload your homework, before the uh, due date, which I guess arbitrarily was Saturday, please, I've opened it up again so that you can upload homework for um, five more squares. So the five people who didn't get a chance to upload their homework, please do that now so that it's all in the coursework and then I can go ahead and look at that stuff and grade it for you. Until Wednesday, <clears throat> I wanna say thank you once again for joining us today and have a good rest of your day. I'll see you next time.